Hello and welcome to Spy Hard's podcast. I'm Agent Scott. And I'm Cam the Provocateur, seeing you at the movies. Mm, absolutely. And we are here with a very special declassified episode, taking a look at the hottest new spy movie. Oh, Cam, I think I've forgotten the name. Scott, I think it's a little movie called Mission Impossible, Dead Reckoning, Part 1. Part one. It's building to something. It's provocative. Yes, we are finally talking about Mission Impossible on Spy Hards. It only took us three years, but here we are. We can't wait to talk about all things Ethan Hunt and beyond. Now, because this is a declassified special, what we tend to do here is have a non-spoiler section at the start for those of you who haven't seen the film just yet, so you can get an idea of what we think about the film, and then we'll get to spoilers later. We will clearly mark when the shift happens, so don't worry, we won't be spoiling anything for you. But if you aren't aware of Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning Part 1, here is your letterbox.com synopsis. Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning Part 1. We all share the same fate <laughs> sure <laughs> yeah I, I ethan hunt and his imf team embark on their most dangerous mission yet to track down a terrifying new weapon that threatens all humanity before it falls into the wrong hands with control of the future and the fate of the world at stake the dark forces from ethan's past closing in a deadly race around the globe begins confronted by a mysterious, all-powerful enemy, Ethan is forced to consider that nothing can matter more than his mission, not even the lives of those he cares about most. Dot, dot, dot. That was like a whole lot of very vague statements about Ethan Hunt that I'm like, this would apply to a lot of Mission Impossible movies, but uh, fair enough. Yeah, something about Ethan Hunt and a deadly weapon. I'm pretty sure I've seen that film before somewhere. Yeah, I think I've seen it maybe six times now. Mm, mm, mm. Uh, but let's talk about it. Mission Impossible. I got the opportunity to go to a press screening a couple of weeks ago at this point. Now, Cam, you just saw it last night. I'm really interested to hear your sort of overall non spoiler thoughts on Mission Impossible 7. So Mission Impossible 7, I'm going to give you a warning right up front. I'm going to be a little unfair. And I'm very clear with myself about this. Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning Part 1 is phenomenal action filmmaking this is a blockbuster entertainment i think people are going to enjoy a lot it is a movie i'm going back to see this weekend and i'm looking forward to seeing it again but it arrives in kind of the shadow of mission impossible fallout which i think is a pretty much perfect mission impossible movie i did a rewatch of it very recently when we appeared on the cinema savvy podcast i saw it twice in theaters as well and I I think that is about as perfect a Mission Impossible movie as you can make. And so it was hard for me not to walk out of Dead Reckoning Part 1 with kind of some nagging criticisms of the movie and thinking like, this just doesn't quite measure up to what I, you know, saw in Fallout. And I I did feel like it was a little bit of a come down from Fallout. It is, to be fair, a Part 1. They make that very clear up front. And that is not something that you had with Fallout. I also just think like Fallout is kind of one of those alchemy situations. You know, it's like they struck gold with that one. And I just think it's very, it's almost unfair to expect the same thing again. It's a little bit like criticizing Thunderball for not being as good as Goldfinger, Mm -hmm. where they've been striving to make something that has the cultural zeitgeist hitting spark of Goldfinger forever. And so I think that's kind of going to be the case with Fallout, perhaps going forward, where it's going to be the one that we look at as kind of the definitive Mission Impossible movie that we all kind of want to see replicated. This one doesn't succeed in doing that, but I was very entertained and thrilled by the experience of watching this movie. It's it's fascinating to hear you say that. And, you know, to preface, Cam and I haven't discussed this film until this very second. We didn't do any a bit behind the scenes before we started recording. This is me learning live what Cam thinks about Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning Part 1. And I have to say, from my side of things, in a non-spoilery sense, I felt the exact same way. Mm. I went in with a ton of baggage. I had just watched Mission Impossible Fallout. We just recorded our episode with Cinema Savvy on the case, so I was it was very fresh in my mind. I was expecting Fallout 2, if you know what I mean. And yeah. 
I was I sat there sort of picking the film apart for some of the decisions it was making and not really meeting it at its level. It was only the, the second viewing I did a couple of days ago now after general release here in the UK. And I was like, no, I'm just going to go watch the film. I'm just going to go watch it and enjoy it. And I had a far better experience with it, I have to say. I think the performances across the board, there wasn't a letdown among the whole cast, which I think is fantastic. I think in terms of a Mission Impossible film, and just, you know, for me, Mission Impossible films are about loosely about espionage and heavily about stunts and action sequences. In terms of that, I think it does a very good job of delivering it. I think it does a actually a pretty good job of delivering the spy stuff too, which, you know, some of the Mission Impossibles in the past have maybe strayed away from that and become more like a Bond film in their own sense. And don't worry, this film is also very much like a Bond film at times. But in terms of an action blockbuster film, with great performances, great stunts, and a good way to spend two and a half hours, I don't think I can recommend any film any more this year than Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning Part 1. I think it was a great experience the second time round. I think it probably would have been a great experience the first time round if I hadn't carried those bags in with me, trying to expect it to be something that it wasn't. But, you know, you've got to think about, like, the team behind this film, Tom Cruise, Chris McQuarrie, who've been putting these films together for a while now, they know how to put a Mission Impossible film together. And there's obviously some issues with it for me, which we'll get into about it being part one. That seems to be a very in thing at the moment. Fast X is a part one. Uh, into the Across the Spider-Verse, it was a part one as well. It's like a very much this year sort of thing to do. It's the new multiverse of it all. I'm not a big fan of doing films in parts, personally. But I think it's pretty successful in how it delivers a, a fairly, uh, you know, encapsulated story by itself. There is a, a small cliffhanger at the end, which we'll get to in the spoiler section. But in terms of my overall thoughts, I had a very good time with this. And I would probably still watch it again in theaters if I get a chance. I think that this one succeeds much better than Fast X and Spider-Verse did at kind of resolving as somewhat of a closed film mm. there's dangling elements that i was kind of laughing with my sister after the movie that were really like <laughs> nudge nudge we'll see you in the next movie kind of moments uh there's some definite material like that but um this one at least to me felt like it told a fairly complete two and a half hour story mm. with kind of like i mean not to give too much away but it's a little bit of like when you watch an episode of I don't know, Ninja Turtles back in the day. And it ends with Shredder being like, I'll get you next time, Turtles. It's kind of like that sort of thing where it's like you have that complete sort of story that would encapsulate that, you know, that episode. Mm -hmm. But there is the looming like, well, Shredder will be back next time and it'll be a different threat or a different approach to what the threat could be. So like in that sense, I think this movie does a much better job where I didn't walk out just feeling like, kind of like the a ripcord had been pulled in the last seconds of the movie, like, uh-oh, uh-oh, cut to black, quick. This one, I think, pulls that off better. It's just not a trend that I agree with you. It's not the sort of thing I'd like to see continue. Um, no, I, I think like when I kind of frame this one in my mind, I am, I'm not really comparing it anymore to, um, to Fallout. Mm -hmm. uh, because to me, it's just, it's just, painfully clear like followed is just kind of one of those magic movies it's like christopher nolan did not replicate the dark knight when he came back for the dark knight rises right like that's just very difficult to do but to me it's like but rises is a great film in its own merit like it, it by itself it's still a fantastic film sure but it ain't the dark knight no and so i'm looking at this one a little more in comparison to like rogue nation sure which you know i really enjoy rogue nation a lot i've watched it several times but I don't put it at that god tier Mission Impossible movie that I do Fallout. So I think this one is actually, I think I would maybe put it a slot ahead of Rogue Nation where I'm sitting now. So that kind of gives you an indication, while I'm going to have some criticisms as to where I regard the movie overall, it's just that like when you are being given a movie like this, like a movie with so much anticipation, so much build up, this movie, you know, had release dates pushed. There was all those pandemic situations where the movie was getting shut down. We wanted desperately to see this movie because Fallout had left us on such an unbelievable high that it was like, we have the magic team of Macquarie and Tom Cruise. What magic trick are they going to pull off next? And 
I think there are some magic tricks, <laughs> some very literal magic tricks in this movie that are pulled off. <laughs> mm. But like in a you know broader sense, there are some real filmmaking wonders going on in this movie. I just don't know that they are as like kind of that domino effect of Fallout, where by the end you're just like, I am witnessing one of the greatest action films in the history of cinema. It's it's a real shame as well, because you think about last year and Tom Cruise and the box office and, and Top Gun Maverick, right? Mm-hmm. And, you know, this is his next film afterwards. And you're almost going and expecting it to be another big heavy hitter like that, the bring him back to the cinema, that's the film kind of film of the summer. And I think... I mean, judging by how the competition is being received at the moment, this might be the big hit of the summer. We've still yet to see what happens with Barbie and Oppenheimer. I mean, you know, Super Mario was a knockout winner, I think, as well. But that's more sort of late spring. Yeah. Uh, the biggest two right now are Across the Spider-Verse. Domestically is number one. I don't know the international on that. Uh, I believe Guardians... Three is still number one internationally, mm. I think. Um, okay. Fast X was a real underperformer domestically, but international has done incredibly well. So, yeah. I mean, we'll, we'll see. We're recording this on opening week. We're dropping this on opening week. So it, it's also the playful Fallout actually lasted in theaters for a very long time, had a very long lifespan. So much so that I think Cam and I saw it together yeah. about like three or four weeks after it had released. Also notably, a uh, follow did not open particularly huge in terms of domestic money. And it was a movie that opened, I think it was like $60 million or something, but right. then just kept earning because people kept realizing, oh my God, this isn't just the sixth Mission Impossible movie. This is a movie you need to see in the theater. This is something that mm. people who were not storied Mission Impossible fans could show up for and really have a blast with. And you know, spinning off from that a little bit, and you mentioned slightly mentioned the media machine that's gone into this film and they've spent a lot of money and a lot of time in publicizing this film putting out trailers putting out press kits putting out featurettes in front of films the the big jump off uh, the tom cruise rides the motorcycle off now everyone's seen that from the trailers to the before films that sort of thing that's not a spoiler at this point i would say no um they're very proud of that and they're very proud of the stunts of this film that's something i wanted to bring up before you know we'll get into the exact machinations of the stunts in the spoiler section but in terms of the expectations of a mission impossible film one of them is top-notch stunts i mean they've been doing that since i mean potentially the first one depends on your interpretation of it but definitely at least sort of four Mm, yeah they've really been up in the ante when it comes to stunts and i i think you're uh if you're going into this expecting some death-defying stunts tom cruise being an absolute madman on screen you're going to get a ton of that yeah, I think you might get a few fewer instances than the previous movie. Um, it is like a part one, part two. So I'm wondering if part two is going to be absolutely stockpile because that is kind of the payoff of the ultimate story. Uh, but this one definitely has a couple showcase big stunt sequences that I thought really delivered. And there is some close quarters fighting in this movie that I thought was incredibly well staged and tense and exciting. And that's not the sort of thing that gets big, you know, bold headlines in the stories. They want stories that are like Tom Cruise risks life to dive off cliff. That's the, that's the story. But in terms of like staging some close quarter combat scenes that were very tense, I thought that this one, uh, was also fantastic. And, you know, just in a general sense, um, you and I, we had a No Time to Die episode recently where we talked mm-hmm. about villains in that movie and how um, it's weird how the Craig era did not have very good uh, like henchmen or henchwomen. Like they were not particularly memorable. Sure. And the henchwoman of this movie is very Bond-like. And I was like, holy smokes, like that is how you create these iconic characters that are going to stick with viewers. Um, again, we'll get into kind of the specifics of the character and spoilers, but like I walked out just going like, that's how you do it. Like, how does Bond, the Craig era, fumble to create these very memorable villainous henchmen when Mission Impossible can do it so unbelievably well and with no real like fuss or muss, like they make it look so easy. No, I, uh, in terms of, I was going to bring up performances and you sort of led us over there beautifully. There's a few that sort of stand out to me, and you know we'll get to other bits in, in a little while. But Pom Clementiev as Paris is the character you're talking about. They plays the henchwoman in the film. Yeah, and 
truly wonderful. I mean, I've been waiting for her to have sort of a breakout role for a while. I've loved her in the Guardians filmed. Is this the summer of Palm? It could be. It, I hope it is. I sign me up. Uh, between her and Rebecca Ferguson, I think this film is is chock full of fantastic performances from fantastic actors. So, you know, I I'm all for uh, Palm. And in terms of my tip of the hat to performances, I actually want to just say I think Haley Atwell is a fine addition mm. to this film series. I was a bit worried about what would happen, and we'll maybe get some some specifics in a little while but i think in terms of creating a character that's endearing that fans want to get behind and also is a lot of fun to watch they knocked that out the park Haley atwell is a prime casting for any film you want to put her in anyway she's fantastic but she seems completely at home in this film and among this cast i thought it was actually very surprising how much of this movie is filtered through her character's pov Mm -hmm. which is not the sort of thing you expect when you show up to a Mission Impossible movie. You know, you think it's either going to be Tom Cruise as the central focus, like in some of the previous films, or it's going to be the team unit. And the amount they gave her character and how many scenes they were portraying from her point of view, I thought was a very interesting angle to kind of change up the energy of a Mission Impossible movie and very effective. And, you know, Haley Atwell fantastic you know of course it's peggy carter in the mcu but i've seen her in several things i remember seeing her the first movie i ever noticed her was brideshead revisited which i covered when i was reviewing movies for my university paper i went to a screening of that film and i was like who is this person this is like a movie star in a you know sort of middle of the road respectable british costume drama and then next thing i knew she was blowing up and she was showing up all over the place and i think one of the things that's really interesting is that her character has a number of scenes through this movie where she's barely speaking. How much of this is a physical performance or just an emotional performance reading her face throughout the movie and just carried off with a home run? It's the sort of thing where you're like, why wasn't Haley Atwell like a movie star like long ago? Like how has it taken mm -hmm. kind of to this point to get this sort of showcase, big blockbuster central performance? I don't know, but I'm glad we're here much like Pom. And just to, before we sort of wrap up the non-spoiler section, I also just want to tip my hat to the direction of Chris McQuarrie. Once mm -hmm. again, I, I think he he knows exactly how to get the best out of Tom Cruise and exactly what people who go to see spy action films want to see in a film. We can quibble on bits and bobs, but I think his direction is pretty phenomenal. He knows how to make an action set piece. He knows how to make things connect. He knows how to make action sequences look good and feel natural and for it to flow very well. And he also can shoot, you know, drama and emotional scenes, you know, fantastically. There's one scene in particular that we'll maybe get into later, but there's a three-way fight, let's put it that way. And it ends on this emotional beat you do not see coming. And it's very, very well done. He is a filmmaker who's just, I think, somewhat underrated because he primarily is known as a writer. And when he's directing, it's mostly just Mission Impossible movies. Mm -hmm. And he's working with Tom Cruise on countless projects. He had a writing credit on Top Gun Maverick, you know, fairly sure. recently as well. But like, this guy knows how to make these big movies. Yeah. And that's something you see in such short supply now is they just like poach talent from all these independent small films that hand them blockbusters and how few of them look particularly cinematic and big. And he just makes it look so easy, whether it is just, you know, the kind of globe-trotting escapade aspect of Mission Impossible or the big action scenes. You know, he obviously has a great relationship with his second unit team. But, like, mm -hmm. it was really, really tough, to be honest, going into this movie after Indiana Jones and not feeling very, very sorry for Indiana Jones. Like... It's kind of embarrassing yeah. to have in such close proximity this movie coming out next to yours and kind of eat your lunch in every aspect, even in sequences that are very similar to things that show up in Indiana Jones. It's it's funny um, you mentioned that because you know someone you always gravitate towards when it comes to film reviews is Roger Ebert, the someone you often quote. Uh, two people that I often gravitate towards are Mark Commode and Simon Mayo. Um, yeah, yeah. You, know, you may or may not know those names, but listeners, I'm sure, will. They saw Dial of Destiny on one day and then saw Mission Impossible 7 the day after. Oh, no. And they did a review and they said, I, I just felt bad for Dial of Destiny. Like, 
it was like I was a warm up act, and then it was Mission Impossible was, was the you know it was a, the headliner basically. It just it completely overrode everything in their heads when it came to Dial of Destiny, and I think that I think I had the same experience. I almost don't remember anything about Dial of Destiny already. And you could look at it on paper and say James Mangold, the director of Dial Destiny, is a much more proven director. You know, he's got got a pretty mm-hmm. long pedigree of some really great movies, you know. Including Tom Cruise with Night and Day. Yeah, Night and Day, one of his all-timers. But yeah, you know, you've got Walk the Line. You've got um, Ford v. Ferrari. There's some really great stuff. But I think when it comes to just these blockbuster spectacle movies, it's very clear Macquarie is tapped into how to pull this off. And while I don't want to see him move away from Mission Impossible movies, please stick with this franchise as long as they're going to keep cranking out these high caliber movies because I don't kind of want a real dip in quality, thanks. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I'm nervous about what would happen if you shake up the energy at this point. But in the back of my head, I am kind of interested to see what like Macquarie would do with other types of movies because he clearly can make a great looking film. And I'll also just throw this out. You know, if uh, you you look at the sort of pantheon of Mission Impossible directors, I guess there's been five. Yeah. Is Macquarie the James Gunn? See the MCU's James Gunn? And if so, should Eon become DC and bring him over <laughs> as their new uh their new guy? There was, I believe, rumors that they were reaching out to him at some point. It has to have happened at some point. It absolutely has to have happened. Especially like maybe uh, when the around the time that they didn't have someone for Spectre when there was a lot of movement with that or something like that. It, it was either Spectre or No Time to Die because No Time to Die, there was sure. issues as well. There was nothing ever like kind of confirmed. Like when you kind of go yeah. through the research material, there's nothing I could really pull upon for those reviews we did of those films. But I, I do have vague memories of hearing that there was kind of some rumors going on there um i just kind of think he's found his place and i'm sure that paramount is very happy having him make uh, mission impossible movies and i am sure they are more than willing to back the truck up to get him to come back to make more of them i think they're just happy to have a successful franchise at this point because paramount aren't doing all that well well i mean you know it's like paramount did transformers and that's a franchise that seems to be on the decline in terms of being kind of these like big blockbusters they the new mm-hmm. one did respectable enough, but it's not yeah. the kind of the smash hit of yesterday. And I think, yes, having something like Mission Impossible that the whole world is kind of paying attention to. And I say that without having seen the grosses of Dead Reckoning Part 1. <laughs> uh, so maybe I'm shooting myself in the foot by saying that. But um, that's a good thing to have. Absolutely. And so I suppose the final question I'll end this section on now, because some people will tune out at the end of this section. I'll throw the question to you, Cam. Would you recommend people go and see this film? 100% yes. I think in terms of what I've seen so far of the summer blockbusters, I really like Guardians 3 a lot, Mm -hmm. but uh, this one is probably the best bang for your buck summer blockbuster thus far. Maybe um, I will change my mind when I see the Meg 2, but that remains to be seen. Uh, I think the Meg 2 will change a lot of minds, but not necessarily for reasons you are alluding to. Uh, For me, I've seen this film now in a normal theater and a theater with Dolby Atmos. I think now I want to go and see it in IMAX. I absolutely think you should go and see it. Uh, You should go and see it and take your time. Get yourself a nice box of popcorn, sit down and really enjoy the film. Go and see films in the cinemas, folks. But if you can, see it on the biggest screen possible because I think this is the sort of film that deserves the spectacle. Well, yeah. And I mean, Tom Cruise had that, you know, viral video he put out where he was like, you know, jumping off a cliff and saying, see you at the movies. Or maybe he was skydiving in that one. I can't remember what that man's doing. It was off of a, it was off of a plane. Yeah. Okay. Out of a plane. Yeah. Okay. Um, and yeah, saying, see you at the movies. And Tom Cruise is one of the few talents out there, I feel like, who is actively fighting to give you a reason to go to the movies. He did it with several of the Mission Impossibles. I would say going back to Ghost Protocol, I think that one was like a see it at the movies. Definitely Fallout, Top Gun Maverick, and he's done it again with Dead Reckoning Part 1. There's not a lot of people out there like that. Christopher Nolan is doing it every time out. He's always trying to create a reason for you to go and see his movie. But, uh, you know, Tom Cruise delivers on his word with this one. 
I don't think I could say much more than that. We don't tackle the knock list here on Declassified episodes, but in terms of a thumbs up, we're both giving it the thumbs up. But warning time, folks, here come the spoilers. If you haven't seen the film and you don't want to hear us talk about spoilers, best to tune out now, go see the film as we recommend, and then come back and finish off the episode. Consider yourself warned. Okay, Cam, the spoilers have been hidden in a trunk at the back of the train, but they're finally busting open. They need to talk. They need to be given some fresh air. Let's talk about them. Spoilers. I think the thing to tackle is the plot, really, off the top of the head. You know, it is a part one, but there is a lot going on on this film. Yeah. The plot itself, I mean, <laughs> I'm not going to break it down for you because I'm hoping most of the people listening have seen it, but is there anything in particular you want to mention about the plot? I mean, this is a classic MacGuffin chase. That is all it is. Uh, we have, I guess, two MacGuffins. We have two halves of a key and a lot of convolutions to go through. It's Mac and Guffin. You put them together. <laughs> Perfect, yes. And uh, I mean, there was points where my head was spinning trying to follow exactly what was going on. Like, the thing is with, like, Mission Impossible movies, they're not that dissimilar to, say, James Bond, where they are, like, a clothesline for massive spectacle you know action scenes mm -hmm. and they're trying to come up with something propulsive to carry you from scene to scene to scene and i think like if you would sit down at you know on paper and chart really the story of the two-part key it gets pretty ludicrous um but i thought in terms of creating a MacGuffin, it works maybe a little better than something like the rabbit's foot from the third one which is sure. just a little too yeah. vaguely defined um but it gets pretty silly like that's the thing about this movie is that it feels in some ways a little sillier than maybe the last film and that it feels like it's both uh, through its MacGuffin stuff with its key. And we'll talk about the villain uh, in a little bit, but like um, it, it feels a little more kind of almost like spy fi uh, than the previous film. Yeah, there is definitely a, a science fiction element to it, especially when it comes to, I guess, one of the villains, if you want to put it that way. You could even argue two. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you could. Uh, I mean, in terms of, for me, I think the plot works. I think there's a, in terms of story, there's a lot of elements that are borrowed from other films, but maybe we'll get to that in a minute. But it is just a chase. It's like a, you know, a, you get to item A, leads you to item B, leads you to the end of the film. It's it's not any more complex than that. But what I will say, uh, as someone who has seen it two times, it is actually quite smartly set up, a lot of it. And there are some quite subtle setup and payoffs. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, I noticed actually like in the submarine at the beginning of the film, for instance, there is a really great moment, um, because we're talking about spoilers, I can get into nitty gritty, but there's a, a submarine and the AI that we're talking about is testing itself basically against the submarine having a bit of fun. Let's underline it. That is the villain of the movie is an AI. Uh, one of the villains. One of the, the main villain, yeah, yeah, kind of. Sure, yeah. Um, and whilst you learn throughout the sequence that it is an AI messing around with the submarine, it does actually tell you a lot sooner. But it's a throwaway line that you don't pay any attention to. Okay. Uh, I'll leave it at that for people who are going back for a second viewing. But and there are a couple other instances throughout the film where it's actually very smartly done, and it's it's that kind of level of detail that I think made me enjoy it a lot more on the second time round. Mm -hmm. In terms of so in terms of overall in the plot, I think it works for me. But as you say, these mission films are basically just a clothesline for stunts. Yeah. I thought this one was a little talkier in terms of exposition than the previous movie. There is a scene at the start where there's all these intelligence heads yeah. exchanging lines of exposition where I was like, this almost feels like a parody of an exposition scene because no one is talking like any human being would ever talk like. It's almost like they are all exposition bots talking in connecting lines of exposition broken up among like 15 characters, it felt like. Well, it's actually one of my notes I wrote about the second viewing is there's a few... Because basically what happens is you have these great massive set pieces and then there are exposition dumps and then a set piece. Yeah. Every single time throughout this film, and I'm not saying this is necessarily a knock against it, but like the exposition is given to you in like talking heads and it's exchanged and like handed off to different people with like a baton between people. It's very strange. Yeah, it's it's a bit disjointed. It almost feels at times like it was all shot separately and then piece together, which actually would connect with the concept of it being done during COVID. Yeah. 
But the the most glaringly obvious uh, of the bunch is that sort of briefing scene at the start where you basically have like a who's who of character actors in Hollywood at the moment. Well, you've got the return of Henry Zerny, of course, for Mission Impossible 1. Uh, as Kittredge, of course. But you've also got people like, you know, Carrie Elwes is in there, Mark Gatiss is in there, Rob Delaney, uh, Idira Varma is there, Charles Parnell is there. Just all in the room just hanging out, talking very seriously about the uh, the, the entity. And then also a couple of like subtle jokes against the IMF, which I, I, I mean, in the press screening I went to, everyone was laughing their heads off about like they actually said the impossible mission force. Yeah. And they're, like they're just ridiculing their own concept, which I actually thought was completely uh, a, a very... Um, very meta, but quite funny. Apparently, Angela Bassett was supposed to be in this scene, uh, you know, reprising her role from Fallout, mm-hmm. but because of COVID travel protocols, couldn't make it. Ah. So there is a framed photo of her in that scene. Uh, oh, wow. And McCory has promised that she will be back in the future. Okay. Well, there is a part two, as we've said, that is coming. But yeah, I... I... I think we'll, we'll probably move on to other bits and bobs, but there is one glaring part of the story that i want to address it's probably my biggest you know mark against the film and mm-hmm. that is a very big death that happens in this film right the death of ilsa faust played by rebecca ferguson and they kind of fake you out they pull a star trek 2 red alert um where ilsa faust is quote unquote killed at the start of the movie mm-hmm. but is actually alive through you know some ingenuity imf style and then you get her death later in the film. And what was your issue with it? Personally, it just felt like it was killing off a main character, a, a female character, to motivate the male. And that's a classic Hollywood trope that just winds me up to no end. I think you'd spent like three films at this point building up the relationship, maybe four films, between Ilsa and Ethan. Yeah. And that having some sort of a spark, it was getting somewhere. And I understand, you know, killing a main character can be a good motivation but i don't it just felt like she wasn't really there for most of the film and then she's just off it didn't feel like it paid any sort of it didn't do anything for the ilsa character it was basically she just got completely owned by this guy who we've never heard of and that was it a meaningless death if we're going to do the star trek reference again sure yeah i mean and there's a lot of flashbacks in this movie that aren't resolved about something with Ethan's past where a woman that he was uh, in some way involved with, I don't really know, was killed by the Gabriel character played by Isai Morales. Mm -hmm. And I guess that'll be resolved in part two. But the fact that then the Isai Morales character, Gabriel, kills Rebecca Ferguson's character, it's like, okay. Uh, And they are very much setting up this kind of this theme of this movie. And I was really quibbling with this. And then my sister kind of pointed out that this has actually been a thing for a long time. The kind of Ethan Hunt as protector of women in these movies, because you had the Tandiway Newton stuff in the second one. You had him saving his wife in the third movie. You had him saving his wife in Fallout. Like, I guess that is more of an aspect of the series than I'd really thought about. But this one really puts a fine point on it, where it is like, there's a point where he even has a choice. He has to save Ilsa Faust, or the Haley Atwell Grace character. It has to choose between the two. Mm-hmm. And ultimately, later in the movie, you know, Ilsa Faust is killed. And I'm kind of torn on it because it's like, in terms of a death scene, Ilsa Faust goes out in a very, you know, badass way. Like she get she gets a great, you know, fight sequence that's really well staged. Mm-hmm. Um, it doesn't feel like kind of like a cheap staging of a death scene. Sure. But there is a bit of frustration because Ilsa Faust was so unbelievably well set up in um, Rogue Nation. And then, um, you know, the actress Rebecca Ferguson was pregnant for Fallout. So didn't do as much in that movie, I believe, because of that reason. Right. Like her role was a little bit smaller just to accommodate her pregnancy. And then in this movie, I was actually a little surprised when the movie started and I saw the opening credits. It's like Tom Cruise Haley Atwell, Ving Rhames, and I'm like, uh, and then like Rebecca Ferguson lands like fourth or fifth or something, and then when you see the movie, you're like, oh, oh, that's why. Like she doesn't have a lot to do, and she gets the death scene, so it's like, okay, I guess like they're trying to raise the stakes of Ethan's mission, 
Mm. It comes at the expense of a fan favorite character. And also, as you said, kind of that situation of like, Ethan throughout this movie is motivated by the death of a woman that we don't know in these flashbacks. And now he's kind of motivated by the death of Ilsa Faust. And also, did this happen so they could kind of clear the way for like sparks between him and Grace by the next movie or something? I don't know. Bingo. That was my next point I was going to bring up to you is like it, it felt like, you know, there was a burgeoning romance between Ethan and Ilsa, even in the Venice sequence that was before the, the death. You know, there's a little hug. They're looking over it's their first time in Venice. It's all very romantic. Holding hands. Holding hands, hugging up. It's all very lovely. And then, you know, this new woman comes into his life. It, it, it's like they want Ethan Hunt to be Leonardo DiCaprio and just sort of have an upgrade and go a bit younger every time. It's a it's a bit of a shame. It is. I mean, I, it's tough to judge it without knowing what they'll execute in the next movie. Sure. Um, but it was the sort of thing that raised concerns, I suppose, about where we're going. Um, yeah. I just I, I I'm not like calling for any of the major characters to necessarily be killed. I'm not lining up anyone else in particular, but it, if you were gonna ask me to pick, I'd sooner Simon Pegg had gone. Yeah. Or you brought Jeremy Renner back for this film and then had it be him. <laughs> <laughs> Poor Renner, he just can't win in the Mission Impossible franchise. Apparently he has one film left on his Mission Impossible contract. Well, I mean, I was talking to my sister when we came out and I just said, What do you think the odds are? that in the next film we get like a Renner, Tandiwe Newton, a Paula Patton, like one of these other agents from the past. Oh, you're getting a full like Avengers Endgame portal sequence as everyone turns up and like, you know, on your left and it's Jeremy Renner. I don't know about that because that was one thing that really surprised me about this movie was that I really thought being, you know, part one of a two-part epic that they would go much bigger with like fan service. And this movie really doesn't. It is a pretty um like standalone Mission Impossible story that doesn't drag up many elements of the past other than the Kittredge character who you could easily walk into this movie having never seen the original Mission Impossible movie and it would not matter whatsoever. Well, it's interesting as well. You mentioned Kittredge coming back. The in the trailers for this, one they also have a shot of Rolf Saxon. Yeah. Who- yeah, who plays um, the analyst William Donlow in the first film, who is the guy working in like the computer room who basically gets sent to Siberia as a punishment for allowing Ethan to hack into the mainframe. And he's in the trailer, but he's not actually in the film. They made a big deal about bringing him back, too. They released press releases about this. Yeah, yeah. And so I, I can only assume uh, he's going to be in part two because... The submarine I mentioned is basically buried nearby, I think, to Siberia where he was sent to. Sure. Yeah. So maybe that's there in for it. But it's just weird that he's in like the press material and then not in the film. So I, I am I am personally expecting kind of like a portals scene or at least like a, you know, Ethan has to call in some favors for this one last mission. Yeah. I mean... You know, you talked about your kind of quibble there, the death of Ilsa Faust. And I, I was kind of a similar boat. It didn't drag me out of the movie too much, but it was the sort of thing that raised concerns, I'll say. So it's mm-hmm. going to depend on how they pay this off in the next one. We interrupt this program to bring you a special report. Attention, spy hards, die hards. Independent podcasting. Much like the spy game requires considerable resources, whether it's research, equipment, hosting, or, of course, constructing a hidden moon base. We're putting out the call for your support. That's right. The Spy Hearts Patreon is the home to our ever-growing lineup of Agents in the Field episodes where we decode non-spy films from your favorite spy actors and The Debrief, where we activate our billion-dollar brains and predict how the spy movie news of today will shape tomorrow. Cam, what have we got in our crosshairs this month? Scott, remember when Clive Owen seemed like a James Bond frontrunner? Well, it didn't come to be, but let's look at his 2006 triumph. And I'm talking, of course, about the sci-fi masterpiece, Children of Men. Get ready for some one-take wonders, people. So accept your mission and hop in the Hellmobile today at patreon.com slash spyhards. But before Spectre agents intercept this broadcast, let's get back to the spy jinx. I had a little bit of an issue with the AI villain. Okay. And to me, there's... 
it's tough to invest me in a movie where the villain has read the script. Mm. And this is very much a movie where every outcome is predicted by an AI. And so ultimately our heroes can't really succeed because A, it's part one. Sure. And B, everything that happens in this movie is entirely foreseen by this AI. And so like that is the sort of thing that's very, very difficult, I think, to stage. And when you are just showing me kind of a glowing eye, kind of like a HAL 9000 thing, unless it has the personality of HAL 9000, it's tough to get me that invested. And they have Isai Morales as this character, Gabriel, who's basically like the human uh, helper for the AI. But I don't understand why. This man might as well be proven to be a robot in the next movie. Well, this uh, this adds uh, to a, a element I wrote down as maybe a, a minor detriment, and that is this extra backstory they've added to Ethan, which doesn't track if you've watched Mission Impossible 1 recently, because in that film it's alleged that he has spent a lot of time working with Jim Phelps, played by John Voight, and he was hired by Jim Phelps to join the IMF, and they were a happy team for a long time until, spoilers, John Voight flips and becomes a baddie. In this film, it's alleged that he was brought in by Kittredge uh, because of a death that he witnessed at the hands of Gabriel, and then he thought Gabriel was killed. Yeah. So I, I don't mind a little bit of the revisionism. It's fine. Canon is... You can be prissy about it. You can't. It doesn't really matter. It's also a spy film. Like Also, Ethan Hunt is one of the most inconsistently written characters in the history of franchise filmmaking. Yes, there, there certainly is that too. Uh, but yeah, I, I, the AI didn't really bother me as much. I guess we're both on either side of our dislikes there. I, I quite liked, um, some of the uses. I mentioned the sort of the nod at the start of the film, but I think it was quite clever how like it overrode the comms in the sequence that led up to Ilsa's death. Um, I, I think there's a lot of interesting things they can do with it, but I understand what you mean. It, it, It almost won't make sense when it inevitably loses because it should have you know figured out what's going to happen yeah and like when you just have like time circumstances like you have that fight on the train and that's the sequence i'm really thinking of when i'm comparing to indiana jones sure we open with this cruddy cg train sequence and then have like an unbelievable skyfall level train sequence in this movie uh pretty embarrassing that hand-to-hand combat in the tunnel is tremendous yeah yeah pretty embarrassing but anyways, the Isai Morales character has like a watch that's counting down and just like falls backwards off the train into a passing truck. And I'm just like, oh, like this is the sort of AI stuff that I just find too goofy. I mean, this movie, I said it earlier, it's sillier than previous Mission Impossible movies. Mm-hmm. And it feels like the AI is almost like, kind of like how I was saying the exposition scene almost feels like a parody of exposition scenes. Some of the AI stuff to me almost feels like a throwback to the days of like the evil computer from the 1960s. Sure. Where it's like, they can do everything. They are watching us at all times. Like It just felt like that kind of cartoonishness to me. Maybe that's what they're going for, in which case, hey, I'm all for paying tribute to Billion Dollar Brain. But uh, <laughs> it was the sort of thing that kind of, at times I was like, I'm a villain guy. I like villains that I can kind of invest in and they have a lot of personality and you just don't get that out of an AI. I can confirm you are a villain. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Mm, mm. No, I, I get it. I think in terms of like other nitpicks of this film that are spoilers, the only other thing I'd maybe throw at it is there are a lot of loving homages to spy films past and even further in the past. But at some point, uh, you, know, you have to add these all together and then you wonder if you actually had any original ideas whatsoever in your film. Sure. Uh, I mean, there's I you mentioned I mentioned Night and Day earlier. You could say that the entire sequence between Haley Atwell and Ethan Hunt uh, and, uh, and Tom Cruise is basically Night and Day when they're driving around. You could say that. You could also say that Tom Cruise was like, "Let's do that one right this time." <laughs> sure. Uh, also, there is like Tomorrow Never Dies nod because they're both handcuffed together, but they're in a car instead of on a motorcycle. There's nods all the way back to Buster Keaton's The General with Tom Cruise on top of the train driving that off the edge of a bridge there's a lot of that my sister pointed out actually a great one which is that they had Haley atwell dressed in gray in that whole sequence like buster keaton right okay yeah yeah yeah, yeah. also the two mains tom cruise and Haley atwell are handcuffed together where have we seen that before cam oh the 39 steps of course of course yeah hitchcock yeah 
for sure. There's also some, just some North by Northwest stuff, but that's always the case with any spy movie. Yeah. One that actually jumped out to me too, one, and this kind of ties into the set pieces. Everyone knows about the Tom Cruise jumping off the cliff on the bike. That's what they promoted heavily. Mm-hmm. What people don't really realize, I think, going in is that that's just part of a extended big sequence. Yeah. And I mean, the cliff stuff is fantastic. Like, just looks phenomenal. But that leads to like a whole train sequence of a train basically car by car going over this cliff as they are climbing up and trying to outrun each car, you know, falling off this, yeah, just precipice. And I mean, there is a bit where they're dangling and it felt completely like an homage to Spielberg's The Lost World. All right. The trailer sequence, which is hanging over. And it's the part where in that, in The Lost World, I think it's like a backpack or something falls and you see it go by the characters and smash out the back window and they're like dangling. Mm. And the same kind of thing happens in this movie. And initially I'm like, they can't be paying homage to the lost world. It's not like the lost world (laughs) is some beloved all time classic, but then it's like, well, you know what? Spielberg is an absolute master of action sequences. And while the lost world is not necessarily the most highly regarded, pretty much everyone who saw The Lost World walked out remembering that sequence as being the highlight of the filmmaking in that movie. So it wouldn't surprise me that like a, you know, like a junkie for creating unbelievable action scenes like Macquarie would have remembered something like Lost World and threw in a little nod to Spielberg. Hey, I can tell you, I saw Jurassic Park 2 The Lost World in a little 40-person cinema in Lou, England, and I still remember that sequence now. Yeah. Yeah, like it's top tier stuff just in a movie that's not spectacular. I think uh, Dead Reckoning, I think it's fair to say, quibbles aside, holds up better as a sequel than The Lost World did as a sequel to Jurassic Park. I won't disagree with that, but we're talking about stunts, we're talking about set pieces. I did want to just sort of broach the question, and maybe we can talk about a couple of my favorites. What is the best stunt of this film? Well, I mean, I think they kind of come all at the end for me, which is the, the bike jump followed by the train going over the cliff Mm -hmm. i think that to me is the kind of it's a little bit of trying to capture the magic of the finale of fallout Mm -hmm. where you had like the helicopter chase followed by the cliff sequence sure and i think this one i don't think it quite hits the level of the ending of fallout but i certainly appreciated the effort and it was very thrilling it certainly was i i probably would agree with you i think that jump still looks phenomenal and when it's given the context of him trying to land on a train as well is even like, well, it feels very much an Ethan Hunt's wheelhouse, but it's still impressive to watch nonetheless. I also just want to tip my hat to the chase sequence in Rome because I didn't think they would be making it on a marge to Fast 10 so quickly. Yeah, okay. We were saying about Indiana Jones having its lunch eaten. Fast X also had like a car chase in the exact same location. Mm-hmm. And oh my God. God, like that's the thing. It's like I, I just hope audiences start getting angry at some of the very like crappy looking movies they're getting. When you have examples like this, or some of the Nolan stuff, or various other filmmakers who are making great looking movies, like really delivering, and people going like, "Wait a second! Like, why am I, why am I accepting some of these real lackluster efforts?" And uh, yeah, I mean that chase sequence. I don't know that it's one of my favorite all time Mission Impossible chase sequences, but it's very memorable and it was fun. Well, it it certainly was Hayley Atwell and Tom Cruise driving. That's the thing you got from it. It was very much in that sort of like Ronin style of that visceral, you're in the seat with them basically being thrown around. I think that would be a really cool sequence to watch in like 4DX with those sort of moving chairs and stuff. I think that would be quite fun to watch in that scenario. But yeah, I, I think there's a reason why they were plugging that jump off the cliff. That is the stunt of the film. Yeah. And I want to note with that car chase too, you had Palm Clementief uh, driving like a Hummer. And it, it reminded me a little bit of Vincent Cassell in uh, Jason Bourne, a movie that, again, I don't think anyone's paying homage to, but it just kind of reminded me of that sequence a bit, which was a highlight of that movie. And I thought Palm was a ton of fun. And that kind of ties into something I was saying earlier when I was saying that to me, it was actually some of the smaller scale stuff jumped out to me as being really effective especially in comparison to a lot of the action movies we watch now where there's that close quarters fight with tom cruise Mm -hmm. palm's character and also another henchman in this very very narrow like alley 
basically and mm -hmm. uh how incredibly well staged that was and it felt visceral and exciting yeah absolutely did and i think a lot of that was chris mcquarrie and i think a lot of that was the ever-flowing energy uh, of pomp mm -hmm. that she brings to this every single moment she's on screen as paris is i'm just watching her i think she and again along with Haley atwell another fine addition to the uh, franchise and much as it is alluded to that she's dead you do find out she still has a pulse at the end so you never know like you said up front like there's no real like weak link in the cast like every character mm -hmm. pops you know the returning favorites simon Pegg, bing rames they're really fun um but yeah like i thought palm was fantastic Haley atwell really clicked and actually a, uh, an actor i really enjoy just in general in life um shea wiggum who of course i first discovered watching um boardwalk empire but it's just an invaluable presence in movies i loved how they introduced as well these two guys, you know, him and his partner, played by Greg Tarzan Davis, who are tracking down Ethan Hunt throughout the movie. Mm. This gave me the type of Shea Wiggum performance that I love, which is just kind of this flustered guy <laughs> trying to achieve something. And they had so much fun material. This could have been a completely yep. generic pair of characters in a different movie. And I was like, please, God, bring them back for the next one. They had that sort of uh, Aaron Taylor Johnson and co feel from Bullet Train the two sort of bad guys in that. I mean, obviously these guys were good guys depending on perspective. But yeah, and, and they, they got to sort of like look at Ethan Hunt's antics from more of a real world perspective and like the the absolute sort of mania that he creates whenever he turns up in a place and the destruction that he tends to cause. And is it for the greater good? Is it the right thing to be doing? And it's nice that they're asking these questions. I think they were always a, a breath of fresh air when they were around. And the other person I wanted to just quickly tip my hat to before we wrap up someone we haven't mentioned once in this entire 50-odd minute episode is Vanessa Kirby, who comes back as the White Widow. She was a lot of fun in Fallout. Only had a little bit of screen time. Yeah. Uh, she has a bit more screen time in this. Technically has to play two characters in a way. And I think she does a wonderful job. Well, I thought that was a smart way of utilizing a like really high-caliber actress in a movie that doesn't have that much time for the White Widow. Mm. Because she is kind of this peripheral character in the overall story. But then you have that sequence on the train where Haley Atwell has to impersonate Vanessa Kirby's White Widow. And so you get to see mm. Vanessa Kirby playing off herself and have this whole sequence where she gets to kind of play herself as an impersonator. And I thought that was a very fun scene. And... uh I don't know if they're going to work the White Widow into future movies very much because like, that's one thing about this series is they'll introduce really cool characters and then they move on. Mm. But I was very excited to see her back and I think they really delivered on what made that character click in Fallout. My money's on her coming back because they made a point of saying she doesn't know Ethan Hunt's name. Right. So I think there'll be a reveal at some point. And I did just want to like this, I've been looking at some sort of early reviews for this and speaking to some of the people I went to the press screening with. This hasn't been a home run with critics. A lot, there are some people that aren't 100% on board. They've pointed out a lot of the things that we've pointed out. Some people have just called it competency porn. I, I understand those criticisms, but I think I have a... a, a especially on that second viewing, I've had a, a very good time with this film. Well, it's a movie... I think it has like 99% on Rotten Tomatoes or something like that. Oh, it does. They're very proud of that. Yeah. It's on all the social media. Yeah, yeah. But it is a case where if you break it down in terms of scores, there's like maybe more three out of five kind of reviews. Like it's a movie that I think everyone has enjoyed. It's just the varying degrees of enjoyment. Mm. Whereas I think like Fallout really had the, <laughs> it had people just like storming the streets in celebration. Just chanting fall out, fall out, wherever they were going. Yeah. We certainly were. Exactly. Totally were. And it's a fine film. I did just want to have a, I, 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 there's sort of one question I want to leave us out on, but I did have one final note. And that is, I mentioned that, uh, you know, Gabriel in the box thing on the train. Mm. Now they're being very smart about it. Just to set this up a little bit, folks, if you haven't seen the film, but you're listening to the spoiler section because you're mad men and women, much like Tom Cruise, uh, the villain, or one of the villains, Gabriel, sneaks onto the Orient Express. We get to see another train in a spy film. Always great to see, and I love the Orient Express. Yeah. Uh, he sneaks on in a box with a breathing apparatus that's sealed, basically. Mm -hmm. I don't know how long he's been there for, but does he not need to go to the bathroom? 
you just go, man. You just go. I mean, how how villainous would you be with a wet patch? I'm just saying. <laughs> well, I mean, it was a wet patch, but they need enough time for it to dry uh, before he moved okay. on with his, uh, you know. The fact that you had a, such a quick answer for that means you thought about it too, you wrong and so I like it. You see, I said I'm a villain guy, and uh, I've been in that scenario many times myself, so, uh, you know, I know all the ins and outs. Cam's just admitted on uh, on air he's uh, sawed himself numerous times. But moving on to the final <laughs> question. This is part one. There will be a part two. Allegedly, it's coming out next year. Where is this going? My hope is that the next one isn't just kind of like continue on this road Mm -hmm. of kind of what we got in this movie, like replicating the experience this time just with another two-hour chase before we stop the AI. I would like this to be a little more like the Infinity War Endgame where they break it up into two very specific, you know, missions or adventures. Sure. And so I guess we're going to have more of an emotional payoff to what the past story was with Gabriel and Ethan Hunt. Uh, This had one of the funniest moments I was laughing about after the movie where it's um, Luther saying to Tom Cruise, like, (laughs) well, I got to go like try to hack this thing. So like, I'm just going to go over there just just off screen. And at some point I'll be back. And so I think we're going to have Luther, whatever he's doing off screen for the uh, you know last third of this movie, he's going to come back and have some sort of solution that will probably kickstart an adventure that will involve stunts and Ethan Hunt finally getting checkmate on the AI. Luther is the uh, the Doctor Strange of this end game. He turns up with the portals. Uh huh. Everyone walks out, uh, even like um, Emilio Estevez. Somehow <laughs> comes out the portal. Has the lasagna, folks. He's back, but his face is all deformed from getting that <laughs> gearbox to the face. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, I, I, I think, I think they've shot a lot of this already. I think there's a lot we haven't seen. I mean, they're, they're gonna have to start off with a submarine because that's where like the AI is being stored for now. Yep. So I think you've got a big underwater set piece to start off the film. This is the Thunderball, folks. I guess. Um, and last time we saw an underwater sequence, I think it was in Rogue Nation or Ghost Protocol, one of the two. Rogue Nation. It didn't quite work for me. A lot of like felt like a lot of CG in there, even though I think a lot of it was actually practical. Yeah. Um, underwater never seems to work for me particularly, so hopefully they deliver with that. Uh, I think I think it's go for broke. I honestly, my prediction. I'm just going to make it now. I think this is the end of the road for Ethan Hunt. Hmm. Uh, I'm not saying he's going to get, you know, Daniel Craig off the face of the earth, but I think he's going to, like, stop being on missions. I think, if anything, he maybe grandfathers himself into, like, the Alec Baldwin slash Angela Bassett slash that sort of, like, running the IMF. The Jim Phelps. He becomes the new Jim Phelps. Uh, if, if Tom Cruise wants to stick around and do that. But I think he's getting to the point where I think he probably needs to stop doing these stunts. What I think would be interesting would be if the next one, because you have so much exposition in this movie and so much setup, mm. and it is a long movie. It's you know two hours and 40 minutes, although I'll say it flew by. Holy smokes, is this well paced. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But it would be really interesting to me if they made like a, I don't know, 110 minute part two, where it is just this race against time to stop the AI. Like we've done all the setup in the previous movie and gotten all the pieces in place with all your new characters mm. and the next one was just like a breakneck stunt filled like rapid fire mission impossible movie the likes of which we haven't had in a while because most of these movies have been quite long in this particular era of the series i can see that happening i mean i'm trying to think of like parallels with parts one and two harry potter and the deathly hallows the part one is almost entirely exposition part two is basically payoff of the last seven films before it which actually adds up very much to what this is too and also part one is like two and a half hours and part two is i think under two hours so maybe you've just predicted it i think that could be kind of cool and i am an ai so yes it will happen oh this entire episode was uh generated by an ai hmm yes mm, indeed but as we said at the end of the non-spoiler section it's getting a thumbs up from us both mm-hmm. support this franchise Go see it in theaters, see it on the biggest screen possible with the best sound system possible and just have your best life while Tom Cruise is a mad lad on screen. 
send the message. We want more movies like this, less like Fast X or, uh, sadly, Indiana Jones 5. Uh, here, here is all I can say to that. But let us know, folks. What did you think of Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning Part 1? We want to hear from you. And if you like what you heard on this episode, please consider leaving us a five-star review wherever you're listening. And don't forget to follow us discreetly, as always, on social media at SpyHards, that's S-P-Y-H-A-R-D-S, on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. But until next time, folks, Cam and I are off to hang out with Luther just off screen. We'll